In my workshop today, I'd like to talk to you about selective realism. It's a technique that was articulated by one of the Japanese masters, Masaoka Shiki, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I've spoken about Shiki before in weeks 21 and 24 of the Haiku P podcast, but I'd like to revisit him today. Many people think that he speaks only to the beginner poet, but if you study him, you'll find that he does have advice for the poet as they advance in their experience of haiku. And that's where I'd like to go today. I'll give you a very brief overview of the man himself, intertwined with a bit of historical context, so you can perhaps understand the environment and influences behind his thoughts. Then I'd like to get into the four principles of shiki and selective realism. Masaoka Shiki, or Shiki as I'm going to continue calling him, was born into a samurai family and a Japanese society which was undergoing immense change. In 1868, just after he was born, Japan was opened up to the Western world. So he was of that generation of Japanese who became exposed to new ideas and philosophies which were prevalent in the West at that time. Perhaps I'm overgeneralizing, but I'll say it anyway. This is the time in Japan when the old ways were becoming redundant and rejected, but as yet there were no new, nothing set in stone. There was, so to speak, a cultural vacuum. Now Shiki left home around the age of 16 to move to Tokyo to further his education, eventually commencing studies in philosophy. There is speculation that initially he wanted to be active in the formulation of foreign policy in this new Japan, but he realized perhaps not the extent of his illness, but that he was ill and therefore would not be able to follow his desired career. He switched to studying literature and determined instead to have some influence in the formulation of the future of poetry, and in particular, tanka and haiku. This still didn't motivate him as a student, he didn't finish his education. I won't hypothesize as to why not, but he threw himself into his self-study of haiku and tanka, and much like Basho, went on a walkabout. At this point, the idea of sachet, the sketch of life, was really percolating through his mind. Shiki was not immune to the conflict between the old and the new societal values in Japan. Despite his desire to be a poet, he also felt the need to be a soldier, a samurai, and go and fight in the First Sino-Japanese War, and yet, because of his illness, he really couldn't. He applied and reapplied for a position as a journalist until eventually he was accepted and sent to China. He found himself in terrible living conditions, which worsened his illness, and as we know, he never did recover. When he came home from the war, he threw himself back into haiku and tanka, becoming involved with the journal Ototo Gisu, writing essays on haiku and tanka and creating thousands of haiku, many of them while bedridden with his illness. Now, before we go on, let me read you one of my favorite of his poems, translated by Yuzuru Mayura. Spring Day, a long line of footprints on the sandy beach. It's a very simple sketch of life haiku, written without adornment, and yet there are layers to it, aren't there? I think I can detect a sense of yujin as well as sabi. Now, let me tell you about Shiki's four principles or states of haiku development. The first, sachet, or sketch of life, selective realism, imagination, and truthfulness. Almost everybody has heard of sashai, or a sketch from life. It's probably one of the first things you come across, well, after you've realized that you don't have to write in the 575 format, that is. Shiki suggested that this was the basic principle of composition in haiku, that beginner poets should accurately observe nature, his criticism of haiku being composed prior to the, his studies 
was that he felt they were often an intellectual exercise. And I think Randy Brooks put it very well in our podcast last month. These poems were in the poet's head. They had little or no emotive connection to the reader. And he advised his disciples that they should take walks in nature during every season. But you know, even in a small garden, you can find a new subject to write about every day. Shiki also felt that the poet should only use words that are necessary. Good advice. I often find that poetic folks brought up on Western poetry have a tendency towards the adjective, or should I say the overuse of the adjective. Once you start doing that, you start to tell people what it is that you're trying to achieve and what it is that they should be thinking or feeling. When you edit the words down so you really only use the necessary ones, you give your reader the information which they can use to fill the blanks, to feel their own emotional response, to come up with their own story and make the poem their own. There has been criticism that such poems can be bland. Shiki himself said that if a poem is too realistic, it's prone to be commonplace and lacking in surprise. It's a fair point, but surely that's the result of us as poets not creating a work that is exciting or interesting. Perhaps we're inexperienced, perhaps we've not put enough effort into finding the right words, and so our, our poem is very blah. Or maybe as readers, we don't put enough effort into discovering the layers within a poem. However, it is possible to create a poem that works just using sketch from life. Shiki himself quoted this example from Basho, which in this instance has been translated by Makoto Ueda. The wild sea extending over Sado Isle, the river of heaven. The wild sea extending over Sado Isle, the river of heaven. I don't know where that is, but it doesn't stop me transposing the image to something I do know. Perhaps in my case, I would be sitting by the local lake. The wind might be blowing and creating quite a stir on the lake, and the sky will be clear of everything except the moon and the stars. And in the distance, I would see white snow-capped mountains over which the Milky Way extends. Now in this next stage, selective realism, we have evolved as poets, and much like Shiki himself, we understand that not every real scene can be made into a poem. We become selective and start to really focus in on something within our natural environment that interests us or moves us. I think those of you with an interest in photography or art have a natural advantage with this method. You have a feel for how to look at something and frame it, and an understanding of how in framing it, you can bring something to life. Each of us has our own unique voice. We have our own taste, we look at things differently. Naturally, when we look at a scene, we're drawn to the beauty of it. But Shiki suggests that some of the most interesting things we could look at and talk about in our poetry are often to be found in the shade. Nothing is perfect, is it? Often there's a little crinkle or defect which makes what we're looking at beautiful, but also more interesting. Let me show you what I mean by reading you a couple of poems from Wally Swist, from his book, The Windbreak Pine, New and Uncollected Haiku, 1985 to 2015. At the river's edge, the muskrat redigging its muddy burrow. At the river's edge, the muskrat redigging its muddy burrow. Drought summer, falling yellow leaves trickling across pools of the river. Drought summer, falling yellow leaves trickling across pools of the river. Depending on what you read, this next stage in the evolution is called imagination or subjectivity. Janine Beichmann suggests that from 1886, Shiki began to concern himself with the role of imagination and poetry, even though still averring that it must be grounded in reality 
So although Shiki still believed that realism was the core technique of the haiku, he felt an experienced poet could now start using their imagination or introducing subjectivity. But how? Donald Keane, writing in The Winter Sun Shines In, speaks of subjectivity. At times, the artist would change bit by bit the placing of objects in the actual features of the landscape. Or he may even modify the actual landscape by subjectivity, bringing in things not present in the view before him. But as an experienced poet, you will be able to create authentic haiku, by which I mean you won't stray into fantasy. But therein lies a topic for another day. How do you arrive at this elevated status of advanced haiku poet? How do you gain the confidence to do this successfully? Well, Shiki recommended reading as much haiku as you can, which is important because, as Ueda says, Shiki's ideal poet is a learned person with refined artistic taste who can distinguish between the new and the stereotyped. Furthermore, he will base his poem on sashai, but will focus on some new subjects or look at an old subject in a new perspective. In the latter process, he may make use of his imagination and depart from sashai, for a poet with a powerful imagination can, if he wishes, create a realistic scene without basing it on actual experience. One of the pieces of advice Shiki had for students in the last stage of their training was, you must combine realism and imagination, thereby producing great literature that is neither entirely realistic nor entirely imaginative. I'd like to give you an example from Shiki himself. At the time he wrote this, he was bedridden. He couldn't possibly see a scene like this. It comes entirely from his imagination but probably based on scenes he's viewed in the past or a combination of those scenes. Across the summer moor walks a traveller on his back, a Tengu mask. Across the summer moor walks a traveller on his back, a Tengu mask. Apologies for the spelling error there. Shiki wanted to appeal to emotions. He felt that a poem designed to appeal to the intellect would not appeal to emotions, whereas something directly observed, something which the reader feels to be truthful, would. Listening to one of my favourite podcasts this morning, I'll put a link in the show notes, I heard Con Igleson, great name that, isn't it, discussing the writing of his prose. He writes historical works. But what he said I felt made sense in the context of selective realism. He said of his stories that stories based in truth have far more power than if they were fiction. I think that reflects what Shiki was trying to achieve. In his later years, he tried very much to focus not just on direct observation of nature, but his inner truth and manifestation of his emotions and feelings, but objectively, without gimmicks or the use of over-exuberant language. He kept things simple. Let me give you an example, which was written in the year of his death. New Year's calendar, during the month of May, a day for my death. New Year's calendar, during the month of May, a day for my death. It's very simply written, it's succinct, and I defy anyone not to feel some emotion when reading it. I don't know if I'm alone in this, but I think from time to time that at some point in every year, I pass the date of my death. But I sincerely hope I'm not as close to mine as Shiki was to his at the time he wrote this. So what guidance can I give you with regard to Shiki's principles of haiku? Your haiku should be a direct observation of nature. You should focus on a small part of the landscape that you're observing 
a piece to which you're connected to emotionally. Remember, you can introduce or remove elements of the landscape using your imagination. And to create an emotional connection between yourself, the scene you're exploring and your reader, only use words that are necessary. Go back and have a look at your work, cut, rearrange, or change the words. Don't overuse the adjective. And I'll stress just once more, be authentic. No writing of fantasy haiku. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you'll find that this is a technique you can enjoy using. <laughs>